Hi, I'm Ari A, and I'm joined by Sonia Kim and Hong Yu Lee today to share findings from my recent study, Learning Autocompletion from Real World Datasets. Historically, state of the art ML code completion models, such as Tab 9, have reported training high accuracy language models on very large open source software datasets from GitHub. In the code completion literature, these models are typically evaluated on their ability to predict randomly sampled tokens provided surrounding program context. Various studies have explored comparing different language models, such as Ngram, RNN, and GPT-2, as well as representation schemes, whole token, byte pair encoding, and copy mechanism. But the question of how well performance on code sequence is appearing in already written GitHub projects translates to real world code undergoing modification in the IDE has only recently been posed. We were surprised and inspired by the work of Helen Dorn et al, who described the concept drift and distribution differences between code sequences randomly sampled from GitHub projects and a corpus of real world autocompletion usages. They examined various autocompletion models from literature and find that performance drops substantially when evaluating on developer activity rather than synthetic benchmarks. Their study outlines several meaningful differences between code sequences appearing in version control and IDE autocompletion. One example shown here is the, is the completion kind distribution. Method tokens are autocompleted far more frequently then these tokens are prevalent in randomly sampled code sequences. Based on this concept drift, we believed that we could build a better ML code completion experience for hack software developers at Facebook by incorporating real world IDE usage and auto completion examples into our models. Our research demonstrates the modeling improvements that followed when we moved from training on already written code randomly sampled from version control to these real world data sets. We also devoted some focus working to understand the distribution differences between version control and IDE code. The rest of our talk is organized to first provide more background on our problem domain and the tool we work on. We'll then discuss the data sets, models, and experiments we leveraged to answer our research questions. Finally, we'll conclude by sharing our results findings, and main takeaways. Based on the motivations that we mentioned earlier, we proposed several research questions. And in order to answer those questions, we need the following experimental setup. First, what are the data sets that we use to train our models? Second, what are the models that we compared? Third, what are our evaluation methodologies? For the data set, we are using this three data set that we collected from our hack repository. First is the baseline data. In the baseline data, we are collecting source files randomly sampled from version control repository, including 977K files. For the auto completion data, data set, we are collecting accepted completion suggestions logged in the IDE. And in total, we have 3.4 million completion events. In the edit data set, it's a mixture of synthetic and real world data. We're collecting code edits logged from each file save operation in the IDE. And in total, we have 1.6 million edit sequences. For the models, first we use the Ngram model. We use the KenLM implementation uh, for fast training and fast inference. And second, we use the transformer model, which is the state of the art in sequence modeling. And we were using the GPT-2 implementation. Third, we used the transformer model plus the byte pair encoding. The, BPP, uh, the BPE technique is a way to tokenize your input sequences into smaller uh, subword units in the purpose of reducing vocabulary size and further improving model performance. For our evaluation methodology, first we evaluate our models offline. We separate our baseline and auto completion data sets into training, validation, and test samples in a ratio of eight to one to one. 
In our baseline test samples, we randomly select identifier tokens, for example, local variables and method call tokens from the test sequences for evaluation. In the auto-completion data set, we use whatever the, uh, the tokens that are accepted by the real IDE users and let the model predict them. We also perform live A-B tests on over 6,000 hack developers internally at Facebook. We integrated those auto-completion ranking models into the IDE for these hack developers. Upon each completion triggered, up to three high probability completion suggestions will be shown at the top of the list with the remaining completion items ordered alphabetically. The developers will be randomly assigned to one of these three groups. Each group corresponds to a model that is trained on one of the baseline or auto-completion or the edit uh, uh, training corpus. This is an example of what you will be seeing in the IDE. Basically, you can see that like the top three items with this Thunderbolt icon are basically completion suggestions produced by the auto-completion ranking model. And you will be receiving different auto-completion suggestions based on different experiment, experiment group. Now let's discuss some of the results following the research questions listed in our paper. The first research question was, does software language model performance vary when real-world autocomplete events are used for evaluation instead of identifier samples from code and version control? In other words, does performance vary when evaluating on real-world developer data? And the answer is yes. From this table here, we can see that for all three models, there is a significant decrease in accuracy when evaluating on real event data. This tells us that there is indeed a concept drift between the data sets and the previous methods of evaluating on committed code may not be the best idea since it does not correspond well to the real developer success. So then we asked, how do we perform better on real world data? This brings us to our second research question, which was, do language models train on real world examples better predict developers' completion suggestion selections? And the answer again was yes. From for all three models, we can see that when trained on actual real world examples, it was able to outperform training on the baseline data set. And one interesting thing to know here is that we also combine the baseline and the auto completion data set, hoping that the neural network might learn better from more training data. But that did not seem to be the case here. And we believe this might have happened because the benefit of having more training data is overshadowed by the drawback of the concept drift by combining the data sets. And with these results, we then ask the question of how our models actually perform, not on evaluation data set, but on actual developers. Because while it's important to evaluate on offline data, since our eventual goal is to boost real developer productivity, doing an online evaluation is equally as important. Thus, our next research question was regarding when deployed in the IDE to rank completion suggestions, do language models trained on real world examples drive greater tool usage? And the answer again was yes. For our online experiment, we're measuring the average number of click-throughs per developer per day. And for both models, we can see that we were able to see more than a 5% improvement when trained on real world examples, both at a p-value of statistical significance. This combined with the offline evaluation now gives us full confidence that the model trained on real world autocomplete data provides the best performance. And now that we have the optimal model to deploy in our IDEs, we kind of wanted to do some more analysis on why this model performed the best. So our final research question was, what are the differences between code and autocomplete or in source code and autocompletion that result in divergent completion ranking behavior? In our paper, we go through these uh, different things in detail that you can read uh, in our paper. So in conclusion, this paper show that there is a concept drift between committed code and version control versus real life production logs. This results in a significant difference in performance, both in offline and online evaluation. And from our studies, we have found that the most optimal data set to train for autocomplete is using real life autocomplete event logs. For further details regarding this work, please check out our paper. And with that, this concludes the talk. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, we are 
Um, we are here in the last Q&A for the um, for the com for the code completion um, session, and we are discussing the paper "Learning Auto Completion from Real World Data Sets." Uh, we have um, several authors here uh, to help um, answer the questions. So, um, and I think that um, Hong Yu will be will be the one answering most of them, although um, Ari and uh, Sonia are here as well. Okay, the first question come from uh, Mikhail Yevtignev. Uh, are you going to release an auto completion data set? Maybe not the exact data set you've used in the paper, but some other data sets sourced this way? So currently, I don't think we have any plans to release any data sets. Or for example, like this, uh, uh, like code completion events that we logged from the IDE. But maybe in the future, that like that's probably one of the, the, the things that we might do. Actually, I don't know if we will, just because it's internal code. Yeah. So we probably will not. All right. So actually, I have a question for you uh, on this. Given that you were trying to do this on internal code, is there something special about Facebook internal code that perhaps doesn't get the results generalizing to other types of code? I, I wouldn't imagine so. Uh, but there's a great diversity of software development that happens at Facebook across um, mobile services, data pipelines, machine learning. And so uh, the models that we that we produce and integrate into the IDE serve like a, a very large and diverse uh, uh, user base at Facebook. Uh, so I, I think that there wouldn't be uh, kind of effects, uh, you know, concept drift uh, significantly between Facebook software development and and uh, external development. Unless there have been some particular. Um some particular expectations, I guess, of the way that that code looks or the way that people write that might be part of the um, developer integration into Facebook that you may not be fully aware of. Yeah, I mean, I think that's certainly possible. Um, but for the purpose of this paper also, just because like we wanted to benefit and boost our um our developers we chose to use internal code i think there's also value in maybe um taking a larger data set from github training that and then also fine tuning it maybe on like facebook internal code and see if there's any difference there as well all right thank you um any questions from the audience Let's wait for a couple minutes. You don't bite and there's no stupid questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you think it might be useful to fine tune the code completion model for the particular user or company using the actions of the developer in the IDE or will this be computationally impractical? So thank you, Mihail. Uh, so, so I think that there, there are two kind of suggestions here. And one seems uh, uh, like a really good idea related to what Sonia was getting at, uh, uh, sort of doing a, a base training on a large, unlabeled, unsupervised um, training on, on code sequences from GitHub and then a fine tuning on developer activity within a specific company uh, that can sort of make model focus on writing code uh, specific to, to that company. Uh, and so, so that seems like super, super feasible and valuable. Uh, as far as like uh, using a specific user's actions go, I think personalization is definitely an interesting uh, question as well. Like, are there different ways that uh, that users use code completion uh, and 
uh, can, can we learn things from users' historical behavior that help us give them uh, better recommendations? Uh, that's not a problem that we've looked at, but it's, it's definitely interesting. Uh, and I, yeah, I, I, I would be curious if, uh, if uh, Sonia and you if you have thoughts on this. Yeah, I think there are some like previous work that discuss about like using like local cache, like for example, like the files, uh, like in the same uh, the the same project that like the the code that you're currently writing, and then like that actually boosts the auto completion performance. Like I think that is some form of pers uh, sorry, pers personalization. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's correct. So I think like that's um, totally possible. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Ariaz um, Iqbali. Thank you for the nice talk. Do project features like project size and number of developers working on a project have any effect on the results of the distribution of next tokens? Uh, I, I don't think we actually, we've, we've actually looked into uh, this. So uh, Ari, do you have anything? Yeah, one, one thing to note is that uh, uh, code at Facebook tends to be uh, developed in sort of a mono repository fashion uh, and that there are uh, sort of links and dependencies uh, uh, sort of between between uh, sub subgroups. And so I, I guess I'm trying to say that all of the code at Facebook is is connected in, in some way. And so it, it would be hard to define what the what the boundaries between uh, the different projects are. It, it could certainly be an interesting investigation to see uh, how um, how some of the distribution statistics and uh, and usage varies uh, by uh, code that's sort of frequently edited and uh, and looked at versus versus code that's uh, that's not touched very much. But it but it wasn't something that we got to explore in this paper. All right. Uh, thank you. The next question is from uh, Peng Yu Ni. Thank you for the talk. I'm wondering whether one of the reasons the on models trained on auto completion data set being better may be that, that the code in this data set is newer than the code in the baseline data set and thus is closer to the evaluation set. So I think we collect the data set at the same time. So basically we collect, so basically we're taking the snapshot of the, the repository at a certain timestamp. And then we basically collect like all the uh, 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 auto completion events before that timestamp. So basically I think they should have the same, like like they're, they're basically collected at, at, at the same time. So I don't think that's actually affecting um, and we, in the paper, actually, we talked about this. It's called recency bias to see if newer data affects it significantly. And we found that that's not the case. All right. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Alex Hoppin. Do, did you measure if you were able to suggest names of new variable declarations based on the context? So, so it's certainly a possibility for, for auto-completion that there are new kinds of tokens that static analysis won't be able to recommend, recommend like what you should name your variables, uh, kind of like string literals and numeric literals, like we, like we heard in the, in the last talk are, are options for auto-completion driven by models rather than program analysis. Uh, for, for our online experimentation, we focused purely on uh, kind of tokens that were coming out of uh, a static analysis language server tool and re-ranking those. And so uh, that set is skewed uh, kind of some of these novel tokens like suggesting names for variable declarations, uh, strings and literals and so on and so forth. We focused purely on, on kind of re-ranking the token types that static analysis could tell us were um, uh, you know, for, for sure valid. All right, thank you so much. We are about 10 seconds from uh, the end of the Q&A. I wanted to use this opportunity to thank uh, everybody for listening to the session and asking questions and for the authors for the presentation.